as we welcome in our coast on the day, the Admiral Bill's double field two star. Good morning, Rob. That listen to that introduction, I realized just how much in control you were last week. You have to remain focused. When have you're to the remain host. focused, and the rest of us were taking uh, divergent tasks or uh, uh, trails, but you always pulled us back. Oh, here's the thing, yeah. Bill. You yeah. know, is, and this is a lesson for everybody who's being asked questions. You got to stay on point. Yeah. The more successful politicians are those who stay on point, Bill. And you, you can't be distracted a, by those questions. And you need a professional to do that. And you're the professional. As I've said before, don't try to host a talk show at home on your own. It's dangerous, <laughs> dangerous work, Bill. You don't know what could go wrong. <laughs> we sit up close and personal every day. Yeah, anything and everything could uh, just hit the... It's not good. Just, phew, scary just to think about it. Uh, let's see here on the uh, Friday program today at 835. We'll be joined by Mike Carl, Larry Schultz, Joe Ferretti by phone, and in his uh, old chair, uh, Jason Barrett. Back in uh, his original seat. And you tried to give it away to Mike Height, but Jason said, nope, it's my chair. Height is out. Gillstrap is in. Yeah. Barrett's chilling. Uh, via telephone, our uh, guest in this segment is the Republican nominee in the upcoming general election for the Senate seat currently held by Senate President Craig Blair. Mr. Willis defeated Mr. Blair in the primary. Tom joins us via telephone where I believe he is sunning and chilling himself. Tom, good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, gentlemen. How's it going? Good, man. How are you? I'm doing well. Doing well. Enjoying the beach. I uh, almost had to call you to bail me out. I got into a scrape with the local law down here. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> what happened, man? Well, we were uh, building sand castles with my, my three-year-old and seven-year-old every day, and... Um, I got kind of a little impatient with those little plastic shovels, so I brought, I got like a Lowe's, you know, like hey. a normal shovel, like a, you know, a Lowe's metal shovel, and uh, so we were working on the beach, and then this uh, elderly lady pulls up in her golf cart with a little badge on, and uh, she she gave me the business. No metal, no metal shovels allowed on the beach, apparently. So it was a close call. Almost, almost, uh, almost went to the clink. I think. <laughs> Did you tell her you served your country? <laughs> <laughs> oh, she was having none of it. Yeah. She was uh, she was clearly a retiree that uh, had too much time on her hands, and um, she was keeping her beach in order. She was going to enforce the law, man. Yeah, where where are you, Tom? Which beach? We're down at Sunset Beach in North Carolina. Uh huh. Apparently, the law is very strict there about metal shovels. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. Who knew? Who knew? Man? Well, you know, you any, set me straight. Anytime that you've been clinked, you know, over a metal shovel dispute, you just give me a call, dude. I'm here for you. That's right. I've got your number on speed dial. Thanks. Yeah. Now, who bailed you out? Was your three-year-old or your seven-year-old? <laughs> <laughs> My seven-year-old, he's, he's quite a talker. So I think uh, nice. he's, uh, he, he worked his magic. And uh, we, we, said we had to set it underneath the boardwalk at the back of the beach. And then uh, all parties seemed to uh, be happy and slowly disengaged facing each other. So. <laughs> 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 with, with your hand on the hip, ready to draw. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You can't turn your back. So. <laughs> Place the shovel down. Put your hands in the air. Turn and walk away from the shovel. Yeah. 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 I was. Uh, I was pretty embarrassed. I, I had no idea that was a rule, and um, and she was she was on top of it. I tell you. So have you something. have you abided by the law now that you're aware of it? Well, you know the. Uh, what they taught us in, in special forces training, Rob, is, um, you know, there's, uh, there's the rules and then there's getting caught. And, uh, so I, I will not, I will not declaratively say that the metal shovel will never reemerge. We'll just put it that way. It's, we'll keep that in limbo, man. But That's you'll right. be more selective when you use it. Yeah. Well, not on her, not on her section. Not on her beach, beach no. Yeah. She's, she's tough. She's tough. As you know, ignorance is no excuse for not understanding right. the law. Right? <laughs> yeah. Whatever. So what's going on, guys? What, uh, what's the topic du jour? Well, last week we had on Brianna Heaney, a reporter for West Virginia Public Broadcasting, who talked about the campaign to oust Senate President Blair and the Stand for Us PAC. So obviously candidates and PACs have to be separate. You can't have... Uh, coordination between candidate and PAC, but the PAC, uh, the Stand For Us PAC, took out ads on your behalf, Tom, and in fact bought ads on, on our station here 
uh, as well. Uh, Brianna Haney's investigation revealed a coordinated effort to remove Mr. Blair from office, and it was over a, a couple of uh, different things, uh, so some laws, 340B being one of those, and how that was co-opted into some type of uh, understanding that while supporting 340B, Senate President Blair was supporting uh, illegal immigration, uh, free medicine for illegal immigrants, free medical care, and that sort of thing, all purported to be factual by mailings that were sent out by the Stand for Us PAC and ads that were taken out on behalf of the Stand for Us PAC. So first, your comment on that, uh, and if there was any coordination at all between you and the PAC regarding those ads, Tom. Yeah, so first of all, there was zero coordination between me or my team in the PAC. Um, you know, that's, that's against federal law, election law. You're not allowed, no candidate's allowed to coordinate with a PAC. Uh, so it was, it was a surprise to us when we saw them come into the race. Um, we had never spoken with anybody on their team um, during the primary. Um, and and I haven't, we haven't spoken with anybody on their team since the primary. Um, so all I know is we did a quick Google search, and I guess they're out of Texas. That's all I know about Stand For Us PAC. Um, but, you know, I think the bigger picture here is, um, you know, we talked about this last time I was on the show. The, uh, the I, you know, I don't want to relitigate the primary. You know, the primary's over. It's been three months. The, the victory, you know, it, it wasn't just a defeat of the incumbent. It was a crushing defeat. And 12 points in a two-way race is a crushing defeat. 12 points in a three-way race is an absolute crushing defeat. And if there hadn't been a third-party candidate in, you know, I would have won by 30 points because nobody that voted for the third-party candidate was going to vote for the incumbent. So I, I'm, I'm not keen to relitigate this. You know, I've, I've been on a couple of shows, and, you know, this, this issue of the PAC coming in, listen, th- there's, there's other organizations that are taking credit for this victory, too. San for Us PAC isn't the only one. And it's funny, you know, I read the article that they put out, you know, to put, Republicans on notice across the country about it. And the way the article read, you know, stand for us PAC uh, basically won the election by themselves, almost like there was no candidate in the race that actually, you know, was there for people to vote for. So and the bottom line is, like I said last time, guys, you know, statistically, if a PAC gets involved in a race, they dump a lot of money in, they can shift three to five points, you know, five points max. And this was a 12-point victory. Um, so let, let's say you shave off five points. Let's say seven points, okay? Stand for us back, you know, shifted the number seven points. You know, there's still a 5% victory in a three-way race, which is still dominant. So I think that this whole conversation is undermining the will of the voters in the Eastern Panhandle. Um, you know, I think that the the message was clear. You know, they... The, the voters in the Eastern Panhandle liked my candidacy better. Um, I think that there were a lot of folks that thought that the incumbent had changed, you know, had been in too long, had was not the same person he was when he started out, and it was time for a change. And um, I think the bigger narrative here that your listeners need to be aware of is somehow the election was illegitimate because there was a PAC that got involved. Well, there were many PACs. And many, you know, outside influences, you know, there were a whole slew of lobbyists and organizations supporting the incumbent. Um, But the the big picture is the will of the voters. And the the election was not illegitimate. You know, there's I think there's a a, an attempt to spin a narrative that, you know, we need to figure out a way to keep the incumbent in power because this PAC got involved and otherwise he wouldn't have lost. That's just not true. Um, He would have lost regardless. And the last thing I'll say on this, you know, the PAC hammered him supposedly on the illegal immigration issue primarily. Um, but, you know, I talked to thousands of voters um, in the meet and greets and, you know, moving with my team around the three counties. And as far as the Eastern Panhandle goes, I mean, that that was not a major topic of conversation that came up. But we asked them, you know, what are your concerns? How can I represent you best in Charleston? You know, and it was a concern on the national level, but at the local level, it was not a major concern. Um, you know, there were more tabletop issues. 
So frankly, you know, this this whole election thing is behind. The the victory was, you know, dominant, and I'm focused on you know serving the Eastern Panhandle. I want to make West Virginia the safest state in the country, the freest state in the country, and a top ten state for education, business, and infrastructure. And that's that's what I'm focused on now. I'm not looking behind. I'm looking ahead. Tom, your potential colleague in the Senate, should you win in the general, Tom Takubo of Can- uh, Kanala, uh, crafted the bill to protect 340B in the state. Would you support the continuation of 340, 340B supports in the state of West Virginia? Yeah, I, ha- I haven't read the bill, Rob, so I'd have to take a close look at it. Um, I definitely would not support you know, any any funds going to illegal immigrants. Um, I think one of the things when I say freest and safest state in the in the country, I think we need to take a hard look at any policies that we have in West Virginia that, you know, support or encourage, encourage illegal immigration. Um, you know, I, 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 I would not agree with that at all. And, you know, another thing, I'd, I really want to see Trump back in the presidency. And one of the reasons is because you know, I don't. I don't think this conversation about um, how U.S. residents pay a much higher price for prescription drugs than other developed countries pay. I don't think that conversation was fully developed, and you know, I'd like to see that implemented more. Um, you know, along the lines of helping to reduce prescription costs for West Virginia residents. So I'd have to. I'd have to take a look at the bill, but I think that. Uh, when they passed it, you know, they didn't do enough due diligence to figure out how, how it could be abused. And, you know, this, this organization came in and leveraged that, that loophole. But again, you know, I, like I said, I'm, I'm focused on moving ahead for, you know, a, an agenda for the state and not, you know, not relitigating the primary. Going back to the 340B, uh, Tom, it's my understanding that uh, only one or two in both the House and the Senate voted against it. Most is as close to majority or unanimous as you, as you can get. Uh, the guardrails uh, have to be pretty high to ensure that no illegal immigrant is not benefiting in some way or the other. Uh, the purpose of 340B, as I understand it, was to provide medicine or medical resources to those folks in the count that in the state that would have difficulty in getting gaining access to the medicine. Uh, that to me is very commendable. Uh, why would you say if there was an illegal immigrant that was getting the benefit that you would automatically vote against that bill? Yeah, I, I think that you know, the when you make a decision on a on a government policy, it really boils down to what, what is the what is the function of government, and it it's you know it's given to us biblically in Isaiah. You know, the essential function of government is to uh, encourage you know good behavior and disincentivize bad behavior. And so, if you're if you're providing an incentive to break our immigration laws and come here and receive some type of benefit. You know, that's that's the antithesis of what good government policy is. So that that's why that's why I would not, you know, that's why I would not uh, be in favor of a policy like that. But, yeah, uh, in net, uh, and I don't know the statistics, and I don't think any of us do, but if net, if something like 80, 85 percent are benefiting the residents of West Virginia and 10 percent, are illegal immigrants is also benefiting. Is that justification for uh, for not supporting a act that benefits a large number of individuals? Well, well, I, I never, you know, I never gave justification one way or the other. But uh, I, I think it's just it's just a matter of having someone that can carefully craft legislation so that it does what you want it to do and avoids doing what you don't want it to do and. You know, I, I've had several people talk to me since the election and tell me they're excited to have someone come into the Senate and the legislature that has a legal background um, for that for that specific reason. So that, you know, we, we've got more people that can read through bills quickly and figure out, you know, where the red flags are, where the loopholes are. And, you know, I'm looking forward to serving the Eastern Panhandle in that capacity where I can digest things fairly quickly and, uh, you know, make the necessary changes so that it protects our West Virginia citizens. 
In the article, Brianna Heaney said she found no ties to 340B and health care, free health care for undocumented uh, immigrants, by the way. Just to throw that out there. Yeah. Uh, Tom, uh, this, the STEM for us, is, uh, shines a spotlight on the PACs. Uh, I'm confused uh, and hope you can help me out. The difference between a super PAC and a regular PAC and what are the, what are the conditions that apply to the candidates? <clears throat> yeah, that's a good question, Bill. And and honestly, you know, I I, I did not. Let, let me just be transparent. I don't know exactly what the difference is. I I think I'm not an expert on the you know the higher level campaign finance law. Um, we, you know, apart from this one pack coming in, you know, we we I don't have a lot of experience with packs coming in to support me as you know the outsider underdog running in the race. Uh, but my understanding is that for PACs, there are um, donation limits, and I believe that uh, if, they're, if they're political PACs, then their donors have to be disclosed. If they're 501c4 organization, then the donors uh, don't have to be disclosed, but the 501c4s have to spend, I believe it's 51% on educating the populace as opposed to straight political activities. And then as far as super PACs go, um, I think that super PACs uh, receive, receive donations from other PACs. And I'm not sure what the rules are, honestly, about disclosing their donor base or what the contribution limits are for a super PAC. Um, you know, frankly, I just, you know, I don't have experience with super PACs. Yeah, that was not meant as a gotcha question, Tom, because I do not know either, and I hear the terms thrown out kind of interchangeably, uh, and I uh, I get confused every time Super PAC versus PAC is mentioned. So. Tom Willis is our guest here on the program, candidate for the 15th Senatorial District. He is the Republican nominee, having won a three-way primary, and by the way, as Tom pointed out, he won all three counties involved in that primary uh, too, Tom. Between now and uh, election day in November, uh, obviously you've begun your campaign already for the general. But when do you begin it in earnest? Do you wait till the traditional post Labor Day uh, holiday to begin it in earnest? Um. Well, we could consider this 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 radio show the the, the earnest beginning. How about that? Mike, I'll deal with that. Sure, <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah, well, we you know we get home from get home from the beach uh, this weekend, and uh, and then we'll we'll hit the ground running. Uh, we you know in July I had uh, pretty much the whole month of July I had um, National Guard drill. We had a bunch of special forces from several countries come in, and we were training out at um, Camp Dawson in Preston County, West Virginia. So July was you know pretty much um, all working on that, and then we took a little time at the beach. And so once we finish this, we'll. Uh, We'll come in and hit the ground running for the general. In regards to a 60-day session, which this year would be later because of February, uh, how do you, between now and then, should you win, prepare what you do with the service, with uh, your law uh, practice as well, in terms of dealing with the 60 days where you'll be working specifically on behalf of the taxpayers of the District of West Virginia, the 15th, that sends you to Charleston? How do you deal with your private affairs and your, your public job? Yes, it's not easy. Um, you know, uh, sorry guys, my neighbor just uh, came out to weed whack his yard here. Is that legal? Um, <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's not metal. All right. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, I think it'll be the same as as working during the during the uh, during the primary and the general, Rob. I mean, the it, it's it's a tough balance, right? I mean, the I was joking I was joking with uh, Sarah this week. You know, as, as a small business means you're only working six hours a day and uh, you know, yep. take a couple hours to get to the beach. But um, fortunately, I've got a great team uh, at our law firm. And, um, you know, we, we've got a great staff that can run our title and escrow closing business for us. You know, so as, as, uh, as things come in, um, they, they, they step up and, and help out. And so um, I'm blessed with good teammates. And, you know, I'm going to focus 100% on the legislature while we're down in Charleston and trust my teammates to, you know, watch my back while I'm gone for those two months. Who's your opponent in the general, Tom? Yeah, I don't, I don't know much about him. Uh, Bill, he's, he's, his name is Murray. Um, he's, 
you know, he, he's very far left. He's a he's a Green New Deal guy. Uh, would love to crush the fossil fuel industry in West Virginia. He's a uh, anti gun guy. You know, he would love to confiscate every everybody's guns. Um, you know, he's he's pro abortion. Uh, so he's he, he's an immigrant from the country of Colombia. Um, and that, that's really all I know. You know, he's, he's very far left and, uh, you know, sta- you know, the guy that, you know, stands against everything that I stand for basically. Um, so, but I do know, you know, some of the large, uh, unions, national unions, um, have already come in and, and gotten involved. So, you know, I'm, I'm asking folks, you know, we, we need to fundraise to, uh, to, to fight this battle. So, you know, I'm asking folks go to TomWillis.com and and please contribute because we do have a we do have a fight. You know, for this general, it's not it's not unopposed, and you know, there's some big there's some big uh, leftist organizations getting involved in the race already. Tom's opponent is Anthony Murray, and his uh, address is out of Cape and Bridge. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, Bill, uh, Tom, I've got about two minutes left. Your priorities should you get elected? Uh, what is uh, what's the, what's your top three list? Yeah, you know, the top the, the the top three hasn't really changed from from the primary. Um, you know, I I just can't stand being last in anything, and so I I really just want to push across the board. So West Virginia is a top ten state in education, and business friendliness, and infrastructure, and I want to make sure that we're the the safest state in the country and the and the freest state in the country. And when I say safest, I mean you know, we need to we need to get more police officers uh, in in the eastern panhandle. We need more. We need a, a higher percentage allocation from the state troopers with our population and, and economic activity. And you know, we need to we need to enforce enforce the law and back the blue. Um, and you know, as far as freedom goes, you know, we need to make sure that uh, government is kept in its proper role. I mean, there is a legitimate, necessary role for government, but the family has a role in society church has a role in society and each of these institutions have boundaries and they need to be respected so that government doesn't cross boundaries and usurp powers and authorities from you know families or or, or the church um, so those are my priorities and um, you know I think that's what uh, the primary voters elected me for I'm hoping that uh, the general the general voters will hire me for the for the same reasons have you committed to a Senate president vote yet should you be elected you know, the funny thing is, we, we probably get about three, four hours of sleep uh, election night, and literally the uh, the Game of Thrones in the Senate after after we <laughs> took out the president, uh, it started immediately. I think oh, my yeah. phone was ringing eight a.m. that morning, and and uh, you know people were jockeying for position. Um, so the quick answer is no. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to go. I'm, I'm going to go and support whoever I think most closely aligns with, you know, what the voters of the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, have told me is important to them. So we'll see how it shakes out. Tom, good to speak with you. I appreciate you taking your time away from the beach vacation because I probably would not have done the yeah. same if someone called me for an interview while I was on vacation. So I appreciate you doing this. And Tom, build the biggest sand castle on the beach <laughs> with a plastic <laughs> bucket. <laughs> I will. I will. I'm going to put a West Virginia flag on top of it, and I'll leave it there when uh, when we depart. So we mark our mark our territory. So hey, thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate you. Have a good day. You and, too. Uh, we'll talk soon. Okay. Good Tom, talking, Tom. Tom Willis, the Republican nominee in the uh, 15th 